Stewart, and I will be your moderator uh, for this session. So this side event is organized by FAO um, and the Embassy and Permanent Representative of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. And it's being held as part of the FAO and the CFAS country members' efforts to systematically monitor the cost and affordability of healthy diets. Um, we have an important agenda today for today's tide of side event because we'll be um, discussing how um, the cost and affordability indicators can be used by governments um, and member states to help formulate evidence-based policies um, so that they can transform their agri-food system so that we can um, ensure healthy diets that are affordable, sustainable, and inclusive. Um, and we're very excited today because we um, have an opportunity to hear directly from a panel of experts. We have five country and regional representatives here um, who have been proactive in, in terms of um, initiating a subnational cost and affordability in their country, and well as um, looking at how they can use it for policy. So we're very excited to have them here today and also to hear directly from them about their experiences and to share across the regions. So with that, um, I would like to turn the floor over and introduce the co-organizer of this event, Her Excellency Dimitu Hambisa Bonsa, the ambassador and permanent representative of the Federal De Democratic Republic of Ethiopia to FAO. Um, the floor is your, your Excellency, please. Good afternoon, you all, uh, excellencies, distinguished representatives from different ministries, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon again. At the outset, let me thank the Food and Agricultural Organization for choosing Ethiopia to co-host this very important session that deals with the cost and affordability of a healthy diet data and uh, analysis to inform agri-food system transformation. Today, so the degree diverges, either south or north, west or east, we are struggling with food insecurity and the malnutrition, mainly due to the scarcity of health diets and it is an affordability. The 2022 report of the state of food security and the nutrition affirms the widespread nature of unhealthy diet and also brought global attention to the fact that, <coughs> sorry, in countries both rich and poor, costs of the health diet is becoming one of the most serious impediments to accessing nutritious foods. Therefore, I want to begin by underscoring the importance of stakeholders' engagement at a national regional and international level to figure out the challenges, develop policies that enables to make healthy diet affordable and accessible. My country, Ethiopia, which extensively dependent on agriculture for its domestic consumption and the foreign exchange earnings has been one of the forefront victim to the malnutrition and its effect. As a result, improving nutrition is highly on the policy, on the high on the policy agenda of the government of Ethiopia, as stated in the growth and the transformation plan two, which aims to reduce young child stunting levels from 40% in 2014 and 15 to 26% in 2019 and the 2020 and the current 10 years development plan 2021 up to 2030 aims to end malnutrition. Ethiopia has also developed the Ethiopian dietary guidelines, which was coordinated by the Ethiopian Public Health Institute with the engagement of stakeholders from the Ministry of Health, Agriculture and Education and supported by the food and agricultural organizations of other partners. Moreover, the nutrition cases team was established 
with the aim of coordinating and guiding nutrition specific interventions being implemented by the decentralized foreign ministry of health structures and the supporting the coordination of nutrition sensitive interventions being implemented by national nutrition program. On the other hand, as the cost of health diets exceeds food expenditures in most countries in the global South boosting production with diversity is very important to bring healthy diets affordable and cheaper. According to Malobo's declaration, which states that all member countries should allocate 10% of their budget for agriculture, Ethiopia was one of the countries who have assigned more than 10% of our budget for some years, but as a budget increase every year, maintaining the same amount of budget for agriculture has become a challenge due to some competing priorities. To maximize the production and ensure our food and the nutrition security, we have taken some policy initiatives, including importation of tax-free agriculture machineries for small scale farmers, fertilizers subsidiary and the supporting farmers to get extension service to work on specialization commercialization and in cluster. However, an affordability of health diet has become one of the challenges for Ethiopia as the cost of the diet is high relative to people's income. If such problems are to be addressed more boldly, we must improve people's income and the livelihood, particularly in rural areas where poverty is higher. We need to strengthen the coherence between our policy and the plans so that have inclusive agricultural transformation to address our nutrition problems. Finally, I feel that a policy optimization model approach, evidence-based intervention combined with cooperation program and the cooperation are very important to deal with the situations of, thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, and for sharing those um, perspectives and concerns that you have in terms of your own country context. That's a nice way to start off. Um, now I'd like to move on um, and introduce uh, Marco Sanchez Cantillo. He is the Deputy Director of the FAO Agri-Food Economics Division, and he's going to be providing us with some opening remarks to set the scene for our discussion before we move on to our panelists. So Marco, over to you. Thank you. Um, distinguished excellencies, um, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, uh, let me express my gratitude to Her Excellency Dimitri Hambisa Bonsa for helping us coordinate and co-organize uh, with FAO, this important CFS 50 side event. My greetings also for the members of the panel, of course, who have joined us today to share their experiences and discuss a topic of growing relevance as the cost and affordability of healthy diets. The reason why millions of people are food insecure and malnourished in the world today is because healthy diets are out of their reach. Diet quality is a critical link between food security and nutrition. Poor diet quality can lead to different forms of malnutrition, including undernutrition, micronutrient deficiencies, overweight, and obesity. Access to affordable, healthy diets have been an increasing focus on, of attention in the world over the last decade, in particular after the Second International Conference on Nutrition, the ICN2, in 2014, and during the United Nations Decade of Action on Nutrition, 2016, 2025. Until recently, however, the available suite of food security indicators have not fully captured economic access to nutritious foods to meet dietary needs for an active and healthy life. One of the core principles embedded in the definition of food security. To fill this gap, FAO, in collaboration with Tufts University Food Prices for Nutrition Program and the World Bank, has developed globally comparable indicators to measure the cost and affordability of a healthy diet at the global, regional, and also at country level. And 
published the first estimates in 2020 through the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World Report, which we know as SOFI report. Since 2020, FAO has continued to systematically monitor progress that was ensuring the affordability of healthy diets, publishing updated estimates of these indicators in the annual SOFI report. FAU is also working continuously in the refinement and improvement on the accuracy of these new indicators to reflect methodological advances and the availability of new data. Starting this year, the full data series will be available on FAO-STAT, and regional and national estimates will also begin to be systematically reported in the FAO-5 Regional Overview of Food Security and Nutrition Reports that complement the global software report. Measuring and systematically monitoring the cost and affordability of healthy diets and making progress towards ensuring the affordability of healthy diets for all is of utmost importance and is urgently needed to inform the transformation of our food systems for improved food security and nutrition for everyone. As highlighted in the CFS plenary this morning, the SOFI 22 shows that almost 3.1 billion people in the world cannot afford a healthy diet. Moreover, it is alarming that the number of people who cannot afford a healthy diet is increasing in every region of the world. And the trend is not expected to revert with the surge of food prices last year and into 2022. There were 120, sorry, 112 million more people unable to afford a healthy diet in 2020 than in 2020, 2019. These new indicators provide crucial information for national governments, international agencies, civil society, and the private sector to work together towards improved economic access to a healthy diet and achieve long-standing goals for global food security, nutrition, and health. Importantly, the cost and affordability of a healthy diet indicators are crucial inputs to policy analysis to guide policymakers and inform policies and investments to improve the affordability of healthy diets for all and track progress towards the goal at global, national, and subnational levels. For instance, as highlighted in the CFS plenary earlier to today, in this year's SOFI report, the cost and affordability of a healthy diet indicators were used to project potential options to repurpose food and agriculture policy support with the objective of improving the affordability of a healthy diet. Then is, there is a notable increase in interest from different regions and countries for more disaggregated subnational estimates of the cost and affordability of healthy diets to facilitate a more granular and context specific policy analysis to better inform national and subnational policies. This is exciting and important. We are ready to support and have already begun to work with national governments to support these efforts. A recent example is Ethiopia, where FAO just started working with the government to deliver policy analysis that will inform decision-making for repurposing agriculture's public budget to align healthy diets affordability and agricultural transformation objectives. I am delighted to have the opportunity at this CFS side event to hear directly from our panel of country and regional representatives who have all already begun thinking planning, or even began the work on this initiative. It will be a great chance to hear about their thoughts, experiences, and plans for estimating some national cost and affordability indicators, and their views and perspectives on the relevance and use of these indicators for policy formulation and improving national or regional policies. I am sure that our distinguished audience will enjoy this high-level discussion. I now give the floor to Cindy to introduce the panel discussion. Great, thank you so much, Marco, and for setting that stage for us for these discussions and really you know, giving the emphasis on why it's so important um, that we start looking at country context um, to look at these indicators at a subnational level so that we can inform policy at that level. Uh, and we're very excited today, but before I go on to introduce the panelists, I just wanted to remind everybody that at the end of this session, we do have a question and answer session um, where you can direct questions to the panelists. But if I can remind you that you put your question into the Zoom chat at any time and we'll be collecting those. Um, and then we'll come back to those at the end of after we go through all five panelists. 
And then just as a reminder to the panelists to please stick to time so that we can get to those questions. So with that, um, I'm very happy to move on to the panelists. Um, as Marco mentioned, you know, we have five um, leading experts here and all of these countries represent countries that have been very proactive in moving ahead in initiating work on subnational estimates or looking at how they can use it in policy. So it's a very unique opportunity to hear some of the, the initial um, countries taking the lead in this and we really are excited to hear about them. So with that, um, the two questions we're kind of posing to the panelists, if they could tell us, you know, what is the importance um, to the government's perspective on monitoring this cost and affordability to subnational level to tell us a bit about that. And also how they are using or how they foresee how these indicators will help them in their policy making. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and move to our first panelist. Uh, I'm very delighted to welcome Mr. Sean Baum. He is the program manager for the agriculture and agro industry development at the Caribbean Community Secretariat. So it's our regional CARICOM body. So with that, Sean, um, I'm welcome to, to enjoy um, to hear from you. Over to you, Sean. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, Cindy. Um, good morning to my fellow panelists. Good morning to everyone who's here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here to be sharing and also discussing this topic. Um, I have a presentation that will go up shortly. So I won't be long because I also want to respect the time as, as provided. I think it's important and timely that we have in this discussion now, because certainly for us within the Caribbean region in the, the CARICOM setup, this is um, a matter of national and regional importance for us. I wanna give a little context before, just to point out that we in the region, we have what is called a regional food and nutrition security policy. And this was approved from, by our regional heads from way back as 2010. And it, it's, it's grounded in four basic principles. One is availability, which promotes production, processing, preparing of affordable, nutritious, high quality Car Caribbean commodity. Uh, food access, which ensure regular access to Caribbean households, just to ensure that the poor and the vulnerable have sufficient quantity of safe, affordable food at all times. And three, food utilization and nutritional adequacy to improve the nutritional status of the Caribbean population, particularly with respect to NCDs, including diabetes, hypertension, sorry, and overweight as well as obesity. And finally, food stability, stability of food supply, which pretty much speaks to the improve of the improving the resilience of the region and the national the national status of communities and households as relates to dealing with natural and economic and socioeconomic crisis. I want to spend a little time and just <clears throat> give a little context, a little background as to what the, the present state of food and nutrition security is in the region. Firstly, CARICOM countries, with the exception of two countries, Belize and Guyana, are net importers of food with over seven of, of our member states importing over 80% of their food, which collectively it's around 6 billion US dollars, 6 billion US dollars for our region in food import annually. Secondly, in the Caribbean region, NCDs are the leading causes of death and disabilities. As far back as 2016, we had 76.8% of deaths being related to um, being attributed to NCDs. Additionally, our current macroeconomic position, certainly within most CARICOM member states, makes it difficult for us to achieve food and nutrition security. And I wanna look at a recent study, as recent as August, that the CARICOM Secretariat did in collaboration with the World Food Program. And it had to do with our COVID-19 security and livelihood survey. And it estimated that 4 million 
people of the 7.1 million, 57% in the Car English speaking Caribbean are food insecure. This is a dramatic increase of 1.3 million since February, 2022. I wanna look at some of the, 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 the important things that came out of the survey. It found that certainly more persons, more persons are eating less nutritious food. Persons are skipping meals. People are also consuming less nutrition diet, less nutritious diets, with people skipping meals, 72% of the respondents. People are buying less healthy and diverse food. Nearly a third of the respondents reporting having no food stocks at home. And finally, diet costs has written, has risen, sorry, within the recent month, with, with food price inflation, inflation above 5% in many countries as a result of the COVID pandemic, climatic shocks, and certain increased prices res resulting from the current war in the Ukraine. Now, the challenges exist, yes. There's high cost of trade, vulnerability to climate change, there's low infrastructure, there's limited um, application of technology, among others. These are some of the challenges that are contributing to regional food, food, food insecurity. Now, within the context of these challenges, there are opportunities. There are opportunities that allows for us as a region to one, increased production of regionally produced nutritious foods, greater South-South cooperation. There's now an opportunity for data-driven policy development. There's an opportunity for greater involvement in youth and women in food and nutrition, awareness, implementation, program projects and projects. And finally, there's an opportunity for private sector involvement. Now, what has the region done? The CARICOM region in response to this food and nutrition challenge has developed a broad framework within the context of our food and nutrition policy. And it's entitled Advancing the CARICOM Agri-Food Systems Agenda, Prioritizing Regional Food and Nutrition Security. Now, we have developed through this what is called a 25 by 25 vision, which seeks to reduce our food import bill by 25% by the year 2025. And this in of itself has the, the support of all the heads of government within the CARICOM, Secretary, CARICOM region. And through this, we have established what is called a special ministerial task force on food production and food security. Now, this entity has been tasked with, what should I say, marshalling, channeling our, all our food and, food and nutrition um, goals, objectives, targets, and ambition going forward. Now, I'll spend a little time and just speak about what Vision 25 by 25 is. It is <clears throat> Vision 25 by 25 seeks to implement actions and critical areas of intervention, which seeks to tackle the, the region mushrooming food import bill. The goal is to improve intra-regional trade, trade creation of wealth, economic opportunity for the agricultural sector for every CARICO member state. The vision recognizes that some key factors are effective that are effective institution, improve infrastructure, knowledge management, adequate in incentives, stakeholder initiative, and a conducive environment towards this. Now, it is a partnership between member states, all regional private sector, all regional organization, producer group, development partners, and civil society. And again, this has been marshaled marshaled by the ministerial task force that has the responsibility to provide guidance on the transform transformation of the region's agricultural food system that is resilient, provides attractive and sustainable wealth creation, and also opportunities for investors, the population, and the general food and nutrition security status of the region. Next slide for me, please. Now, there are key air focus, focus areas that are, that are being tackled and they are listed there. I won't go so much into them, but these are critical structural areas that we believe in the region 
that once we're able to monitor these, implement them, we've, we've put them together in grouping. But I mean, if I do the question and answer se section, I could go into greater detail. But we've put them together in groups and we believe these are the six areas that once we're able to tackle these in a very systematic way, in a very coordinated way, it should bring us to the area that we're trying to achieve with the food and nutrition security. Um, next slide, please. Now, from an operational side, we've looked at what are the main commodities that we have to look at. One, we've done the analysis. We have come up with a plan. And six commodities that we're looking at are one, poultry meat, hatching egg, corn and soybean production, rice, meat having to do with beef, pork, spice and herbs, herbs and spices, roots and tubers. Next one for me, please. Now, we have seen positive development. We're now seeing the traction taking place. We're seeing certainly on all areas, every single member state within the CARICOM setup has developed their own implementation plan that has collectively rolled into the 25 by 25. The political will has been secured for this. Added to that, the communications plan has been developed and is being rolled out throughout the region. It is now a regional priority, food and nutrition security. There are various activities that are being put in place as, as are listed there to tackle the same. Um, next slide, please. Now, take me back to the other one, please. Now, it's important to note that with the, head of, with the help of the F FAO, we have now start develop a, a stoplight tool, which is now assessing the food and nutrition security status of the region. For each member state, we have undertaken the necessary data, we have undertaken the necessary data collection, which is mapped against our regional food and security, food and nutrition security policy to see where we are as a region. Green meaning that we're achieving the target, amber meaning that we are behind, and red meaning that we're horribly behind, to put it simple. So we've developed this tool. This is a tool that is ongoing that we're using and we're doing the necessary data collection accordingly. Um, thank you much. I'll pause there in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean, um, for sharing you know, the, the severe problems that you're facing in the region and also you know, how the region is looking to, to move forward. Um, with that, let me turn to our next panelist. We do have one panelist um, that is not online. I'm not sure why. So we're gonna move on to our third panelist. So with that, um, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Nasir Ahmed. He is the chief of the nutrition section in the Ministry of Planning and Development and special initiatives of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. So it's very welcomed. Please, Nasser, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much, uh, Afro, uh, for uh, this opportunity. Uh, I have a small presentation. Uh, next, please. Uh, with the uh, support of FAO and uh, Tufts University, uh, we have initiated a study, the cost of affordable healthy diets in the country. Uh, actually, Pakistan is basically an agricultural country, so we uh, don't have any issue with the avail availability of basic item food items, but we remain issue of the affordability, especially the healthy uh, diets. This study uh, is, a, is a realistic economic standard that measures economic access to nutrients, adequate diets, keeping the view cultural context. And this study is also aligned with the mission of the nutrition section of planning commission, that is to ensure food and nutrition security by promoting cost-effective nutrition intervention through coordination, awareness, and behavior change communication research also. Uh, these studies have implication for policy planning and monitoring advocacy also. In the monitoring side, it has us to healthy diet for improving program designing and the educative side to promote nutrition interventions uh, are aimed at meeting basic nutrients, food requirements at, at all level. And this, this interventions 
uh, framework for policy decision is making and prioritize educate intervention strategy, enhancing agriculture and food system for policy, social safety needs, and nutrition advocacy at awareness or at all level. Next, please. Uh, these are similar studies and few our policy documents we prepared in the post, like uh, Pakistan uh, in, uh, multi sectoral nutrition strategy. We have prepared the bottom up approaches, and we have also prepared a food composition table for Pakistan. Previous, it was more than 200 food items, but now we have uh, an process to review it, more than 300 cook raw and cook food items. We've also regularly we, uh, in the country, we uh, estimate the cost of basic food items like uh, basic cost to provide the 2150 calories per capita. Per. Next, please. And this is the minimum cost of diet. We have uh, the support of WRP we have uh, conducted two years ago. And then we have prepared in Pakistan, the Pakistan Dietary Guidelines for Better Nutrition. That is laid down the dietary needs for which is being used for the calculation of cost of diet. Next, please. Uh, these are the uh, few findings and also the procedure we adopted for data use in the cost of affordable and healthy diet in the, in the country. Uh, uh, the, the data was collected from the for the month of May 2020 from our regular survey known as Pakistan Bureau of Statistics Survey. For the rural price data, 27 districts we have collected and for other we have 79 food items. For the urban side, we have 35 districts and 19 food items. This is the districts were throughout the country. Next please. And we have used 71 common food items, including three food items from wheat, wheat flour, wheat flour bags, and food items like rice, two rice varieties, basmati, and broken also we use for that. For other common items calculated, we use meat, uh, milk, dairy products, pulses, fruits, and other food items, they are uh, regularly used in our local markets on the urban and rural like samosa and imco or in some beverages like tea and other mineral water also. Next, please. Uh, these are the summary of the findings, the least cost food items selected for the May. It, it, it shows the variation in, in the cost like sugar and, and, and refining. The sum of the cost minimum purchase was uh, uh, different like dairy product, uh, milks remain higher side and uh, other fruits and vegetables while remain on uh, lower side. Over the, the cost per day of the healthy diet uh, uh, was per day was 184 PKR to meet the sustained 2030 calories. Next please. Like uh, this is the cost of the diet for May 2020 of different promises. For the Punjab, it is 184, like uh, uh, Pakistan, and Punjab 177, and Sindh 183, and other provinces, KPK 192, and Balochistan, it was 194, and the overall the trend was 184 uh, from the July 19 to May 2022. Next, please. Uh, some other indicators under this calculation are we use another indicator like uh, what into uh, like performance weight are being calculated using the highest uh, uh, 18 and 90. On the affordability side, we use we are using four indicators of affordability are being calculated uh, cost of compared to food poverty line also and compared to observed per capita per day food expenditure also. This is also highest data and percentage of of, pe uh, of people who can't afford the cost of healthy diet, number of people who cannot afford healthy diet also. These indicators uh, bring important insight into affordability of a healthy diet as per the country's diet guidelines. Uh, all these indicators and their data uh, will find it will help us to draw a roadmap to guide the policymakers for the next national nutrition policy or our food safety policy also. Next. Thank you, Farywar. Yes, great. Thank you so much, um, Nasir. That was really interesting and it's, it's very um, inspiring. I think Pakistan is ahead of many countries and really, 
getting down to estimating at a subnational level the cost and affordability of healthy diets. So there's a lot I think people can learn from Pakistan's experience. And also, you know, really highlighting, you know, the, the within country variations in the cost, especially I, it's interesting that you also can look at it through rural and urban. So we'd be looking forward to hearing and seeing more of those estimates. So with that, um, let me turn to the next panelist. So I'm very delighted now um, to welcome Mr. Stevier Kayatza. He is the principal economist at the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs of the Republic of Malawi, and also PhD candidate with the economics at um, University of Sheffield in UK. And we'll be delighted to hear about Malawi's experience um, in estimating subnational cost affordability. So over to you, Stevier. Uh, thank you so much, Cindy. Yeah. Yeah, so basically I'll be presenting uh, on Malawi's experience uh, on estimating cost and affordability indicators and possible opportunities that we can uh, exploit in Malawi. Uh, so in Malawi, uh, we have a national sector nutrition policy that is being implemented between uh, 2018 and 2022. Basically, to provide a framework uh, for successive implementation of nutritional uh, response, uh, existing and emerging national and global issues, but also to uphold the government, government's commitment towards uh, eliminating all forms of malnutrition. So the policy has about eight priority areas, and these are linked to other policies. For example, we have Malawi's vision, a national agricultural policy, and national health policy. However, when we think about uh, healthy diets, we do that, see that uh, healthy diets, making them to be more affordable is not one of the, uh, the policy agenda in Malawi. So Malawi has experience in estimating cost and affordability indicators uh, through Kandasa project. Kandasa was a changing access to nutritious diets in Africa and South Asia, and it was being implemented by Tufts University and in collaboration with International Food Policy Research Institute between 2018 and 2020. So through this project, uh, we managed to use existing data that the National Statistical Office collects across uh, markets in Malawi, basically to compute a consumer price index uh, on a monthly basis. So the data set has uh, a rich list of diverse foods that are mostly consumed uh, by most households across Malawi. So the second phase of the project uh, is now to empower the National Statistical Office. So we have developed Excel and Stata files uh, that can facilitate computation of uh, cost of nutrition adequacy indicator across various market places. So this will make it easier for the National Statistical Office uh, to monitor this indicator, but also to publish it along with the uh, CPI indicator on a monthly basis. So in terms of opportunities that we do have, uh, we have several areas what we, where, where we think like we can integrate uh, the cost and affordability indicators in our existing programs or interventions. So we have humanitarian response program, uh, which basically assists uh, people who are food insecure every year. And basically we do we give them uh, food items, for example, maize staple, legumes, oil, and soya bread. But also in some instances, we do some cash transfers uh, equivalent to accessing these food items. So there you can see that even the, the list of food items that are being part of the uh, humanitarian resource program do not basically address the issues of healthy diets there. Then we have also social safety net uh, cash transfer program. This one is a, a national program that basically targets uh, ultra poor households with cash on a monthly or bimonthly basis to uh, help them access food. But then when you look at the transfer values, they're way, way below what they can allow these households to access uh, healthy diets. Then we also have uh, other social protection programs like maybe minim minimum wages. So minimum wages in Malawi are based, uh, revised based uh, on inflation, but maybe we could instead look at uh, revising the minimum wage based on the debt costs. 
So these are some of the areas where we feel we could integrate cost and affordability of uh, ethyl diet indicators in our existing programs or intervention. Thank you so much for your attention. Great, thank you so much. Very interesting to hear. Also, um, not only the experience of estimating the cost and affordability, but where you're looking um, to help inform, especially something new that not many people are talking about is the humanitarian response and cash transfers to, to use that indicator to help um, look at how you would set those limits as well as the so social safety nets and other social protections. Very interesting perspective there. Um, so thank you so much um, for sharing that. So I, just a reminder, we have one more panelist um, and then we'll move to question and answer. So if you have any questions for the panelists, please put them in uh, the, the question and answer box and we'll go to that after we hear from our, our last panelist. So with that, um, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Natasha Bergit Donaner. She is the Director of Planning at the Minister of Agriculture of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Um, and we're very happy to um, hear from her. Guyana is a new country that's coming on board to do this initiative. So she's there new at this stage and we're excited to hear from them on what they're thinking about as they get started. Natasha, over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, all. Uh, so, thank you for sharing, um, inviting me to share Guyana's experience in promoting uh, this indicator and in context of um, promoting affordable diets for all in transforming our food systems. Uh, so, like all other countries that we have, Ghana has been seeing increasing food prices um, since 2014. There is a 12% um, increase in our food prices and a general inflation we have seen about 6%. And what COVID-19 pandemic has taught us uh, demonstrated that our food system is, and our supply chains are fragile and susceptible to shocks. Um, so therefore, easy cost of living is a high priority for our government. And the current state of policy agenda in Guyana is to improve economic access to both nutritious and that, nutritious food and healthy diets. Um, so for instance, in Guyana, we um, have seen, like for example, our diabetes rates so it's about 6%. So it's both priority for Ministry of Agriculture and other government offices. Um, my colleague from the CARCOM Secretary, Sean, had mentioned a lot on the regional um, policies for advancing our food system, but I just needed to mention it as again, it's the chair of the ministerial task force that you mentioned, and our national policies are highly aligned with those both of the International Sustainable Development Goals and of the CARICOM uh, Food System Agenda and Vision 25 by 2025, reducing the CARICOM Food Import Bill. Uh, so nationally in Guyana, we have had policies to um, increase our food production and, and to advance food security since 2019, for example, from the Grow More Food Campaign. We have had our low carbon development strategy. We also have um, a food and nutrition security strategy, our national school feeding program. Um, recently, with the UN Food System Summit, we've held our dialogue. We have the pathway document for food system transformation, and we're also working on our food safety authority. So there are clear policies, um, programs to support our farmers, investors, um, in what is needed to transform our food system. One of these, um, so. Let's just look at some of these. I won't go into all of this, but generally uh, there's clear policy direction. There's commitment by His Excellency, our President, Dr. Mohamed Irfan Ali, um, and there is investment in agriculture. One of the commitment that the government has made is to increase agriculture expenditure in the national budget as um, 
was said earlier to 10%. We are currently at 5%, so that commitment is there to increase it. We are investing in large scale our cultivation, for example, um, corn and soybean, which is heavily needed for the livestock industry. That is one of the um, investments. Actually, um, to do that, what we have invested in about 12 new commodities within the sector to um, advance our food production. Because we do know globally there is um, the goal to bridge the production gap because we see that we need to increase our production by 70% globally to meet the 9.5 billion people that um, that's a target by 2050. So we have a target of about 4 to 50% by 2025 to increase our production. Um, we are working on developing high yield pest resilient varieties, for example, in rice to upgrade our infrastructure. Uh, Guyana has a lot of, um, in terms of flooding, we do suffer flooding. So DNI infrastructure is very important, farm to market roads, uh, strengthen our support services, maybe extension, weather forecasting, finances, and upscaling our skill set. And in all of this, we're working very closely with um, our regional counterparts uh, to dismantle basically trade barriers, to improve transportation logistics, the challenges that we face, to have CARCOM reach, well, CARCOM and internationally to um, be able to have affordable diets. Um, so this is just some of the commodities that we're focusing on, and Sean already mentioned some of those, so I wouldn't go into them, but uh, for aquaculture, livestock, and crops, these are all areas that we are focusing in Vienna and the CARCOM. So this indicator um, is a recent development, and um, so I got this information online that FDO is calculating it. And it is a relative cost of food relative to the income. So it does both at our food production and the income of the individual. So one of the things that we have noticed is that CARICOM has a very high cost and affordability of health diet. And in Guyana, we also have a high relative to the average um, but consideration also, and I think there was a question in the chat about the peculiarities of each country. For example, in Guyana, we have 90% of the population living in one um, coastal lands, while about 90 in the hinterland are internal regions where there is um, the indigenous people, where their culture also affects that um, affordability, let's say, or their because um, it's more a cultural thing than uh, food security in that way. Um, and finally, in terms of the use of the data in policy making, I must mention that we are working very closely with FDO in Vienna for many years in um, not only for development of our agriculture statistics system, we have done assessment of it, and we're currently working on the strategic plan for agriculture and rural statistics. We also have uh, worked with the FIAS indicator in Guyana, and in right at this moment, we're doing our population housing census, where we're collecting information on how to report on our FIAS, both at the Ministry of Agriculture and National Statistics Office, there's close collaboration with FEO to strengthen our information. Um, so what we are doing now is to closely monitor this indicator. We are happy for the technical assistance and the work provided by FEO. And I am sure that over time we can continue to work with FEO and our um, national stakeholders to track the progress of this indicator so that we can monitor um, our policies. Outside of this, and just like the previous presenter mentioned, um, there are many social programs that we are working on outside of Ministry of Agriculture, for example, in Guyana, 
we have increased our uh, minimum wage. We have many social programs and transfers for farmers and vulnerable population and input distribution programs. So all of this, we have used the data that we have seen and implemented programs and we will continue to do that with that. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Natasha. It's very interesting to hear, you know, what you're outlining as the potential uses and especially in terms of an integrated in your monitoring framework. Um, so we look forward to continuing to engage with you and see how, how things develop. So this um, concludes um, our set of panelists. Um, so we would like to move now to the question and answer. And we do have a few questions that have come in. So I would like to go ahead and, and start with one, if it's okay. Um, the first question is, um, you know, many countries are just beginning to think about how to um, estimate subnational cost and affordability of um, at indicators for healthy diets. But we do have a couple of countries on the panel, Malawi um, and also um, Pakistan, who have already done it. So maybe I can direct this question to both of you. The question is, what are the biggest challenges um, that you have to overcome in establishing subnational cost and affordability of the healthy diet indicators? Um, so maybe if I could ask um, either Malawi or Pakistan, if they'd like to come on and maybe talk about what some of their challenges are in, in, in establishing this in terms of time, in terms of you know, data challenges or coordination. Um, so the floor is open for our panelists for that question. May I uh, reply? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Sundit. Uh, in Pakistan, we have set mechanism for data collection from federal to provinces to uh, major districts. Due to this, uh, uh, available of data, it's not difficult to calculate the cost of healthy diet or affordable to diet over there. Uh, at routine, monthly, uh, on a month basis, we collect the uh, cost of food basket from uh, the over, uh, national, provincial, and even our district level. If the data is available, then there's no issue to calculate and to uh, uh, use further. But if, if it's any uh, issue, there's break in data collection, there's break in the data from grassroots level, not provided in the meantime. So there is a challenge to calculate the cost or to estimate for further findings over there. Okay, over great. Thank you so much, um, Nasir. Um, did we, did Stevier, did you wanna come in with some learning from Malawi and maybe what challenges there could, countries could face? Yeah, so I think uh, it's the same challenge that um, Nazir had uh, mentioned. So, like countries like um, most of most like countries like Malawi, you know, the emphasis is uh, consistently collecting data on staple foods. So sometimes, you know, they they don't have um, enough funds to collect data on these other diverse foods, but that that are so uh, nutrient dense and important households. So keeping track of those on a monthly basis poses a challenge to the National Statistical Office. But I think if they're adequately funded, that should not be a problem to uh, update the, the indicator on a monthly basis. Yeah, can you comment um, the, the consumer price, the National Consumer Price Index that are um, calculated and collected in most countries, does that give the price data that you need for doing the subnational? Can you, so yes. the question is, can you, can you tap into other existing price data collections to come into um, calculating this indicator? Uh, thanks, Cindy. So I, I think I'll just talk based on uh, my experience in, in, in Malawi's, Malawi's um, estimation, estimation procedure. So like we, what you need to do uh, to have, to estimate uh, cost of, Cost and affordability indicators data is for some uh, months consistently, like maybe a year or so. So, like for Malawi, uh, 
the way the data collection is done for uh, consumer price index, it encompasses like uh, cons foods that are most re commonly consumed. So that makes it easier for us like to co compute now uh, the cost of the cost and affordability indicator measure. Because it like the, the food list is, uh, has about 55 food items that are commonly consumed across uh, Malawi. So that is an advantage to us to use that data. Okay, thank you. Nasir, did you want to add anything to that in terms of your experience in Pakistan? Uh, yes, Cindy. Uh, the, regarding the CPI, current price index, that, that, that is our main, main source for this uh, analysis we need. And one thing we also feel some challenge, like the food items data being collected by the regular surveys. If there's or major food items, some minor may be missed over there in the grassroots level, so it's difficult to calculate them and calculate them in the cost of healthy diets. Mm -hmm. Cindy, you are muted, I think. Okay, yes, great, thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay, so why don't we move on to another question and, and Nasir, unless you wanted to add anything else? No. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the next question. Also a very interesting question, which is um, there are different entry points um, to mainstreaming the objective of making healthy diets more affordable into a, a country policy agenda. For example, it could be introduced within the health and nutrition sector, or some it could be introduced in terms of the agricultural sector, or even social development sectors. So the question is, is what are the challenges in a country context for identifying where best place and how to enter, introduce this um, into the polygen for mainstreaming? Um, if you can talk about challenges or even ideas, even for countries that maybe haven't started to collect the indicator, but what you're discussing or what you're thinking, where's the best place this situated and how to create those interlinkages since it applies to so many different um, sectors and also ministries. So the floor is open. Um, is there anybody that would like to step up and maybe try um, tackling that question or even if it has to raise more questions about it? Okay, does that mean it's a very challenging question? <laughs> yeah, so maybe we could hear like, uh, you know, um, Sean, you know, taking the, the regional perspective and you, you, you identified a number of regional programs and also problems at a country level. Where, where do you think uh, most of the interest would be in terms of um, mainstreaming this? We've heard it's in, Sometimes it's integrated within nutrition, um, agricultural policy, also in statistics divisions from a monitoring perspective. Do you have any thoughts on that? It's a difficult think, question. No, no, no problem. I mean, it's, we, we're here to solve difficult problems. So we have to start with difficult questions. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a combined approach that is needed. As, as I always say, everybody must eat everybody has to look about their health. So it's a combination, uh, it's a combinated approach, a combined approach that we'll have to use. Certainly it cuts across, um, certainly agriculture, stats becomes an important issue. And if we look at a regional perspective for us, it's a collective approach that deals with macro, macroeconomic factors and, and, and so on. So certainly from a statistical point of view that deals with economic planning, um, certainly from an agricultural point of view that deals with production and certainly from a health point of view that deals with nutrition and how it is that we use this data to plan, as I'd said before, in our regional policy that deals with that. This data that we're trying to collect, that we're trying to develop, is to, to, to point us or target us in, in such a way, cutting across those areas that we just spoke about. And I, I do say that there are also cross-cutting issues, certainly, 
as we become a little bit more climate resilient in, in our planning and our execution, execution of projects and program. So those are the four areas that I'm, I'm seeing us looking at it. But again, this is from a, a, a macro regional perspective, because again, I have to appreciate that each member state is at a different stage in terms of development. Each member state is at a different stage as relates to capabilities and so on and so forth. So um, that's the first go at it. That's how I think we should look at it in a, in a collective joined up approach to deal with the stats to indicate how it is that we implement, how it is that we plan, how we tackle some of the challenges that we have. So that's, that's how I look at it first. Great, thank you so much for those thoughts. Uh, maybe I can give an opportunity for Natasha. Uh, maybe you, is there anything you'd like to offer in terms of Guyana's at the beginning stage in terms of where you're discussing about it? I know at one point you're talking about also the, um, the humanitarian um, platform, which this is needed, but maybe others. How are you, how is Guyana starting to think about this? So we are basically looking at this in a combined manner, as Sean would have mentioned. Um, most of the interventions in Guyana for this healthy diet or easing the cost of burden, as we, we are terming it here, um, is both at agriculture standpoint with the cash transfer to fishers and farmers. We also um, are looking at it as a cost of production to ease that fertilizer prices have gone up considerably so to reduce the cost of production of our um, agriculture commodities. In terms of the social programs, um, like I mentioned, it's the vulnerable groups that are targeted to assist them so they can afford a healthy diet since those are the most that the healthcare system um, would be burdened with. And Overall, with our health care system, it's improving primary health care and also more public awareness of that. So it is a very difficult question, like you mentioned, uh, but what we have done is to tackle it in all the um, subsectors. And we are working right now on the data to make sure that we can make better informed policy decisions with that. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Natasha. Um, that was really nice to hear a kind of another perspective and thought on it. And it is very difficult how to get these interlinkages across the different sectors um, and the relevancy. Um, is there anybody else that would like to add anything on this question or maybe I have one last question, but it's also a difficult one. Um, before I go to the last question, would somebody like to add anything else to this question about the interlinkages and where in the policy agenda, the indicators fit to best inform. Okay, so with that, I'll go to the last question. Um, we do need to close in about five, six minutes to turn over for the closing comments. Um, but let me try this question. It's it's also coming in from, um, from our chat. Um, the question is, do you think that the cost and affordability of healthy diets can help link with the livestock management plans. For example, and it even said, for example, in Malawi. Um, so, so let me throw that question out. I don't know, um, Stivia, if you want to try and tackle that since they were directing it to Malawi, um, but also the floor is open to others. Yes, and can you come again on the question, sorry. Yeah, so the question is, is that, um, do you think the cost and affordability of healthy diet indicators can help link with livestock management plans? So we've heard, you know, about agriculture and cash transfers. What is the relevancy of the cost and affordability indicators and information to livestock management and the livestock sector? Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, so I think uh, it can help because we are looking at access at the end of the day. But then if, if households are able to raise livestock by themselves, then they're technically just leaving some money. They can 
buy, say, animal source foods and then divert that to other, you know, nutrient-based foods. So that can be a better way to reduce maybe the overall cost at the household level. I think that's how I would comment on that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, anyone, anybody else would like to comment on that on this last question? Yes, it, uh, this can be aligned and with the livestock or other uh, sectoral departments in Pakistan to promote the protein di uh, diets. And we are here to have subsidies for rates of the poultry uh, like egg or chicken and are distributing on the uh, uh, one project uh, like SAS National Animal Program. We are here to uh, provide and cheap, cheaper site and even some the rural areas also. So it should be linked with the livestock and fishes sectors also. Cindy, just, just from my end, I, I would I would also just to support the fellow panelists. I think we'd have to look at it in the, the context of efficiency and competitiveness because the data would have to use to see how it is that we can prove what we're doing to get um, that cause the, the necessary reduction in, in costs and, and also cause the, the, the improvement in terms of output. I think you'd have to look at this in terms of efficiency and competitiveness and certainly not, of course, not getting rid of the nutritional value that needs to, that's needed to be had it, to be had accordingly. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Really challenging questions from the floor, but very good questions. So thanks to um, everybody for asking those questions. Unfortunately, we are out of time for the Q&A uh, and we must shift to the wrap up session. Um, it's been a very rich discussion, the panelists, and um, this is a new area that countries and regions are starting to venture into. So um, thank you to all of the panelists for sharing these thoughts and experiences that we, you know, at a very early age as we start to move forward. Um, it's quite inspiring and there's a lot that we needs to be done. Um, and we'll be looking to share your learning and experiences in other forums. So with that, um, I would like to turn over um, for the last concluding comments um, to Lynette Newfeld, who is the Director of Food and Nutrition Division at FAO. Lynette, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cindy, and, and thanks to the team for inviting me to uh, provide a few comments at the end of this very interesting session. Um, it's been a pleasure to join you all, and, and I've been watching. It's, it's great to see, despite many different um, ongoing activities, quite a, quite a good group of people on, online today. Um, so malnutrition, whether undernutrition or overweight and obesity, affects health and human function at all stages of life, from child growth and brain development through school performance, work capacity, to health and well being of the elderly. As a result, malnutrition limits the progress of households, communities, and nations. All forms of malnutrition have multiple causes, but healthy diets are a necessary condition for prevention of all of them. Healthy diets can take many forms depending on local food access, traditions, preferences, and other considerations. But to be healthy, Diets must meet a set of common criteria, for example, the adequacy of nutrients aligned with individual needs, among several others. The common approach being used through the cost and affordability of healthy diets indicators draw on that common, those common criteria and shed light on the fact that the accessibility of healthy diets is out of economic reach for over 3 billion people today. With the lingering effects of COVID-19, several conflicts and climate related events, it's likely to be much worse in 2022. This has to change. I'm sorry, it's very noisy out my window. I hope, it's, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, to realize this change, policy and programmatic actions must be responsive to local contextual realities. Today, we've heard the experience of four countries that are moving beyond awareness of the issues of the unaffordability of diets to generating the evidence needed to understand the constraints, the opportunities, the trade-offs, and to develop contextually adapted actions to address those. I certainly can't capture all of the rich discussion that's gone on today, 
but I would like to highlight two key messages that I heard. First, it's easy to get scared off by the complexity of collecting subnational data and particularly subnational data on concept that is so complicated as related to the cost and the and dietary patterns as people uh, consume them. But the experience of Pakistan and Malawi show us that despite that complexity, with good planning, prioritization, and creative approaches to using existing data sources, those, that complexity can be overcome and the needed data can be generated. Second, achieving healthy diets and reducing all forms of malnutrition require action across all sectors. There's no two ways about it. Unless we have coexisting actions across sectors, we will not achieve the reductions in all forms of malnutrition that we want and through the changes in healthy diets that we would like to see. Again, this is difficult. And that, for example, reflected in the question that was asked from the floor, it was an excellent question and it's very difficult to answer. But again, we heard good examples of how local data on cost and affordability of diets can inform humanitarian social protection and social safety nets to ensure that the package that those programs are providing are responsive to the reality uh, of the potential beneficiaries of those programs in the local context, in the reality of that local context. Multi-sector plans like that what was mentioned in Pakistan must consider all sectors implicated in promoting healthy diets, but then action needs to happen within those sectors. Each sector has their mandate and that plan helps in see the vision of how that all fits together and can result in the uh, outcomes and the advances that we hope to see. I also really enjoyed hearing about the regional initiatives such as Paracom that can provide a framework for uh, within a region that has a set of, of common challenges and can set up very concrete um, targets and a series of actions that can lead towards that. Again, as part of a broad uh, multi-sector framework um, that is ultimately needed to achieve uh, reduction in all forms of malnutrition. And with that, uh, I thank you again and pass it back to you, Cindy. Great, thank you, Lynette, for that kind of overview and wrap up and really highlighting some of the key messages that came out. I think you really, you know, highlighted a couple of really important points about, you know, it is feasible to do subnational data collection for cost and affordability, building off of existing systems and the whole point of the multi-sectoral. So it's been a, a very exciting event. We do have to conclude now. Um, this session has been very complimentary to the preliminary um, discussions and on um, the plenary this morning. And I'm sure it'll be informative in the next few days as we go forward. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody, um, your excellency and all our panelists and all of our participants. And thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.